We have uh, two gentlemen here who have uh, served our country. And your name is, sir? Harry Hadley, H-A-D-L-E-Y. And I'm Chico Ramirez. Okay. Uh, would you like to share some of your interesting stories with us? Maybe we can both share the pet no more. <laughs> We're both pet. Well, yeah. I, I first came into service in 1948 in the Naval Reserve while I was in high school. And uh, I probably would have stayed with that and uh, gone with the Navy when I got out of school, except my father said that I was too lazy to work for a living, that I needed to get some education. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he said, this is back in central Pennsylvania, he said, why don't, why don't you go to Penn State? Uh, they had a center back here in San Jose, you got San Jose State, you know. We had the same thing back there in central Pennsylvania. And I thought, well, you know, what have I got to lose? And the first day I showed up there, I had this 1937 Chevrolet, and I thought that was kind of neat. And here was all these new rich guys from Philadelphia and Pittsburgh showing up with brand new, not just brand new convertibles, but customized on top of that yet. I thought, hey, you know, this rich stuff's got something going for it. I think maybe I better get that degree. And, uh, of course, if you are in the reserves and then you go into ROTC in college, uh, you can't be in both past your sophomore year. Well, the senior ROTC is considered the military, the same as being in the reserves of the Guard. So they gave me a, a government discharge and threw me out of the Navy. And uh, it's probably good because I don't swim all the way. And uh, next thing you know, I graduated now I'm a, I'm a second lieutenant in the Signal Corps, which was good because in the Navy I was learning radar. So, uh, unfortunately, you can't fresh pay out of, out of school, uh, you can't pay for a brand new convertible, which I just thought I had to have. So I heard about this aviation thing and went to flight school and that's how I became an Army aviator. And that was in uh, 1954. I was in the first class at Fort Rucker. We opened Fort Rucker 54K and it, it had been closed since the Korean War and all that stuff. And uh, I did later, I got out in 57. I went back to helicopter school and all that junk. But I didn't like the way they were treating the retired people. They were taking people with 18 years of service and just throwing them out. And they needed to get 20 to get a retirement. I just, I thought, I don't need this, because I was a manager in, in a steel mill. I ran a heat treating plant. And so, like I said, I got out. And I joined the Guard, that's the way the Army Guard. And next thing you know, I'm moving up from the steel mill and, and I found out that that uh, I was the commander of Army Aviation for the National Guard for the whole state of Pennsylvania, which was good. We had really good people. But uh, I, I didn't like the way that I, let me just tell you, I have had more weird things that have happened to me than you could believe if you were writing fiction. <laughs> For example, we went up to the tank museum up here, Jacques Littlefield's yeah, tank museum, we were up in uh, Portola Valley, and uh, they had, uh, outside of this one building, the last time I was up here, I looked outside and said, what is that? That's a propeller from a big ship. They call it a screw. Okay. At any rate, uh, I asked one of the docents, uh, I said, what's, what's the screw? He said, that's off the Lusitania. I said, if it weren't for that propeller, I wouldn't be here. What do you mean? I said, well, I said, my father came from England. My father came from England, and his father had this brick mason and iron mills. And they had bad economy about the turn of 1900. And he was having trouble making good for his family. So he talked to some guy and said, well, why don't you go to the U.S.? He says, we uh, have lots of jobs over there. He said, well, 
Uh, I can't afford it. He said, well, I couldn't either, but I worked my passage on a ship. So he did too, and he came over. About a year later, he had enough money he sent for the family, and they came over on one of the ships in the day. And, you know, they had different ones that were called the regular bus route. And uh, after a little while, they went back for a visit to her mother. That's where I would have saw it. And uh, after they had, had a, you know, some months visit, you know, we're getting ready to come back to the U.S. And uh, she contacts me. I got this from my aunt here before she asked her. Last and uh, I don't know whether they wrote or wired or what. She said, I'm getting ready to come back to the States and send money. And uh, he says, well, you know, we're doing a lot better than you. When you came over the first time, he said, why don't you book passage on that new steamship, the Titanic? <laughs> and she wow. oh, do you think we could afford it? So, yeah. So they got tickets. They're all booked on the Titanic. And they got up and everybody said, oh, how did you get so lucky you were on the Titanic? They got up to within about two weeks of the passage, and all of a sudden, her mother, oh, if you leave now, I shall surely perish. I'll never see you again. I think I got the papers. <laughs> so, at any rate, she said, okay, okay, okay. So she turned in the tickets to the Titanic, and they booked on the Lusitania. And the Germans torpedoed that in World War one off of Scotland, and they went down and salvaged and got uh, some pieces off, including out of the If it weren't for the Lusitania, it wouldn't be here. So I said, you know, how can you picture stories that are that weird? But that's, that's what real life is.